Thank you for coming out on such a cold Minnesota morning. I, um, I'm a latecomer to history. I didn't like history class in, at Minnesota High School, and I never took any college classes in history. But a few years ago, I was asked to design a couple of history books, one on Christmas Lake, and then following that, uh, one on Lake Owen in Cable, Wisconsin. And that kind of piqued my interest in local history. So when my uh, Lake Fellowship group decided to do a, uh, a celebration, a 50th anniversary celebration of our A-frame and our location in Shorewood, I volunteered to do a presentation about the history of the property. And it turns out the property used to belong to Peter Gideon. So, how many of you have heard of Peter Gideon or know anything about Peter Gideon? Okay. And how many of you know quite a lot about Peter Gideon? Okay, so correct me if you think I'm saying anything wrong. About all I knew about Peter was on this banner that I designed for the Apple Days Parade. And Peter, it said Peter was a early settler, the creator of the wealthy apple, which was named after his wife, Wealthy. And I wondered what was the big deal about an apple. So I went to the local historical societies to start researching, and I quickly figured out that history isn't as straightforward as I thought it would be. Uh, there are facts, and there are a lot of alter alternative facts floating around. And there are stories which may or may not be true. It's kind of like the telephone game. Uh, it was a lot like detective work, where I would make discoveries, find clues, and then try to put them together to solve various mysteries. And sometimes it appeared that they couldn't be solved. My first big discovery was that apples didn't grow in Minnesota. And I thought, what? We have apple days, we have the arboretum, we have apple orchards you can go to in the fall. Lots of people have apple trees in their yard. But back then, uh, apples didn't grow in Minnesota because of the cold winters. Horace Greeley was a newspaper man and a, a famous public figure in the 1800s. He, he was very much in favor of westward expansion, and he would travel to places out west and then report about them in his newspaper. And in 18, <coughs> 1860, he went to Minnesota and wrote that he would not live in Minnesota because apples didn't grow there. This was kind of a blow to Minnesota because it was a time when the early territories and states wanted people to come there to help settle the land. And people were actually avoiding Minnesota because of what Horace Greeley had said. So why were apples so important? They were considered the king of fruits because they were not only delicious, but they were very versatile and they would keep a long time. And that, of course, was important to the pioneers. Peter Gideon was a third generation American from German and British Welsh ancestry. His great-grandparents uh, left Europe in the mid-1700s to come to America. And on the way, Peter's grandfather was born, and his great-grandmother died. We don't know if those events were related. But his 
great-grandfather and grandfather arrived in America. They both fought in the Revolutionary War, and supposedly they fought together in the Battle of Germantown, shown in this painting, under the command of George Washington. Peter's father was also a soldier who fought in the War of 1812, 35 years later. Eventually, the Gideons moved west to Ohio, which was a common stopping point for westward migration. And Peter was born there. Now, Peter's birth date is one of those alternative facts that floats around. So, I'm going to correct it here. He was born in 1820 and died in 1899 at the age of 79. Peter's passion for fruit growing started when he was just a young child. He liked to tell the story of having planted peach pits when he was five years old and eating peaches from the trees that grew by the time he was nine. When he was 21, Peter moved to Illinois, which was then the real frontier of the West. Minnesota was still only a territory. And it was there that he met his wife, Wealthy, or rather, he met Wealthy, who became his wife. Wealthy Hull is often said to be the daughter of Stephen Hull, who was a another early settler that lived just north of the Gideons at Hull's Narrows, which is now, which we now call the Narrows. But he was not Wealthy's father or a relative. Uh, Benjamin Hull, who, came, who was a prosperous farmer that came from a Connecticut family. And he lived in Illinois. That was, he was Wealthy's father. So Peter and Wealthy got married in Illinois, and Peter continued growing fruit. He was a, a self-taught horticulturist, culturalist who had experimented with fruit growing ever since the peaches when he was young. At some point, he developed lung problems, and the doctors gave him a year to live. They suggested that he go to Minnesota, which was known at the time to be a very healthy place to live with a very healthy climate. This was a problem for Peter because everybody knew that apples didn't grow in Minnesota. However, he resolved that he was going to figure out how to grow apples in Minnesota, and they did move to Minnesota. They arrived in St. Paul in April of 1853 by riverboat, and this is the this is the boat that they arrived on. It was called the Time and Tide. They made the three-day journey to Lake Minnetonka and laid a claim on Gideon's Bay, which of course is named after him, and eventually owned 160 acres in what is now Shorewood and Tonka Bay. Peter had brought 350 apple seedlings with him from Illinois, as well as apple seeds, which he planted and which, of course, died. He wasn't discouraged by that. He bought more and planted more, but decided that in the meantime, having a family, which eventually grew to seven children to support, he needed to have another way to make a living while he was figuring out how to grow apples. So he liked to tell the story of how 
He sold his plow. He took all the money he had, borrowed another $500, and bought cows in Illinois and hired two men to drive them up to Minnesota. Apparently, the men sold the cows along the way and disappeared, and Peter never saw cows or the men again. This was a huge financial setback for him, obviously, and having a family to support, he had to work part-time for other settlers. This is a picture I took from the approximate location of the Gideon House on Gideon's Bay. Uh, this was taken just last fall. Gideon's daughter, Florence, wrote memoirs where she describes a happy childhood and living in an idyllic natural setting, which this would appear to be. They were poor, but they had everything they needed. They had good food to eat and were sufficiently clothed and were intellectually nurtured. Both Wealthy and Peter were very educated, some of it self-educated, but very well read. And they had books in the house and all the children uh, read widely. During this time, Peter, in spite of the poverty, continued to buy seeds and seedlings and plant apple trees, and they continued to die. And he was very much of a scientist, which was sort of new to things in the 1800s. But he, he knew that or his approach was to plant, keep planting, plant as many different kinds of seeds and trees as he could, and eventually he was going to find one that would withstand Minnesota winters. After about eight years, he figured he had planted four to 5,000 apple trees and only one and part of another one were still alive. So he decided it was time to leave Minnesota and he told the story of announcing to his family that they were going to leave Minnesota, which apparently was positively received. And the next morning he woke up excited and said that, no, he was going to give it one more try. They were down to $8 and heading into winter. Peter needed a winter coat very badly. The others had already been provided for. And he took the, their last $8 and sent to Maine for apple seeds. And for a coat, he took two old vests and sewed them together, patched them, cut off two old trouser legs and sewed them onto the vests for sleeves. And that was what he referred to as his poverty coat, which he wore for six months. And during that time, he never left home. According to uh, Florence's memoirs, it sounds like this wasn't necessarily an embarrassment for him. And, and in fact, he kind of chuckled at the whole thing. From the seeds from Maine, eventually grew the wealthy apple. So what was such a big deal? Why was the wealthy apple such a big deal? The wealthy was the first full-size, good-tasting, good-looking, which was important to marketability, apple, that could withstain sustain or could survive even the worst Minnesota winters, which they called test winters, and it lasted through the winter. It became a huge commercial success after being debuted at the State Fair in 1968, 
and it was grown all across the United States and Canada and even known in parts of Europe. The wealthy helped spawn the rise of the thriving fruit growing industry in this area. This is the Excelsior Fruit Growers Association building that until fairly recently stood on 3rd Street in Excelsior, just across from the parking lot of the Excelsior Brewery. The wealthy had proved that apples could be grown in Minnesota, and exhibitors at the fair liked to put up signs saying, Horace Greeley said we couldn't grow apples in Minnesota, next to their displays of apples. Because of the success of the wealthy, the Minnesota legislature passed a law forming a state fruit farm and purchased land just north of Gideon's farm and made Gideon superintendent of the fruit farm. The purpose of which was to continue to do experiments and develop other apples and other fruits that could thrive in Minnesota. He was given a salary of $1,000 a year, which had to cover expenses, too. Oops. So Peter, Peter was, became very well known. He wrote profusely and published in farm journals and newspapers advice about growing apples, wrote letters to farmers encouraging them to grow apples. He, he gave away seeds and seedlings freely in the effort to spread apple growing. And he was never in it for himself, never in it for the money. He felt that it was for the good of society and mankind for everybody to be able to grow apples. It had something to do with theft, reducing theft. <laughs> Amidst all the accolades in my research, I noticed there was always the caveat about his personality or his peculiar beliefs. He was obviously uh, a nonconformist, and he had some peculiar ideas that were not necessarily peculiar, but uh, unpopular at the time. The 1800s were a time of reform movements, and Gideon supported many of them. He was an abolitionist. Even as a teenager, he would travel downriver to the south to speak out against slavery, and he he tells the story of one time when he was almost lynched. He supported women's rights, women's suffrage, and he supported the temperance movement. He had some quirky ideas. At a time when beards were very popular, he hated beards and let people know it. For a couple of years, he took up phonetic writing, thinking that it was more efficient and would save time in reading and writing. It didn't catch on, although uh, Teddy Roosevelt, subsequent to this, Teddy Roosevelt tried it for a couple of years, also unsuccessfully. Gideon was what we probably today would call spiritual but not religious. He didn't associate with conventional religion, although he read the Bible and had all his children read the Bible. He was a spiritualist, and spiritualism was uh, popular at that time. 
there were the, the second spiritualist temple in Minnesota was located somewhere near Lake Minnetonka. The spiritualists believed that you could, we could communicate with the dead and that the dead were a source of wisdom and advice and knowledge for us. Lake Minnetonka was a very spiritual place. Uh, I'm going to finish something here. A couple of the things that I came across, although it wasn't usually published in articles or in the journals of the Horticultural Society, Peter liked to tell about how the night that he decided to leave Minnesota, a spirit had appeared to him and given him the name and address of the man he should write to in Maine for apple seeds. And Peter said that he got up and lit a candle and wrote these down so he wouldn't forget them. Neighbors also said that he had an uncanny ability to find stray livestock and that he was sometimes seen on his horse, uh, sitting in the road, still, supposedly believing that his horse saw something ahead, some invisible obstacle, and Peter waited patiently for the horse to move on. However, it was also reported that this was often in a shady spot. So Lake Minnetonka was a, an important spiritual place to the Native Americans. This is Spirit Knob near Wyzetta. Uh, my best friend in high school was a descendant of Samuel Gale, and her grandmother told stories of seeing Indian campfires on Spirit Knob where they made pilgrimages long after they had moved out of the area or been moved out of the area. There were lots of Indian burial mounds around Lake Minnetonka, and especially on Gideon's property. Two surveys were done in the 1870s, and one of them found 98 Indian mounds on Gideon's land. Gideon was a big defender of the mounds at a time when it was a popular pastime to go picnicking out at Lake Minnetonka and dig into the Indian mounds looking for relics. He told another story of a spirit having come to him after he had dug into one of the mounds on his property. He felt very ill and the spirit told him to cover the bones and close the mound. So after that, picnickers would arrive. Uh, the people that managed Lake Excelsior or Lake Minnetonka excursions would actually advertise mound digging as an entertainment, and they would arrive on Gideon's land with their groups of people. Uh, one story about a Baptist Sunday School group, and Gideon would shoo them away. Even during and after the Sioux Uprising, the Gideons were friendly with the Indians. They were upset by the abuse that was given to them and understood and respected the fact that they were encroaching on what had been their hunting grounds. Gideon's, uh, shall we say, prickly relationship or prickly personality was evident. You know, that reminds me, I do want to read something. A woman wrote to Gideon asking if he had any Indian relics, and Gideon's answer 
shows both his attitude toward the mound digging and the uh, and and shows his prickly personality. Dear Madam, I have no Indian relics and don't know of anyone who has. And as to Indian treaties, they can only be had in the National Archives, and for the credit of the American nation, it would be well that they were burned so that future generations should not know the meanness of their ancestors in the making of fraudulent treaties with them. And then, as greed prompted, violate the treaties and drive the Indians from place to place as often as the rich wanted their homes and lands. Exterminate them, then name rivers, towns, and cities in honor of their names. So Gideon was a founding member of the Minnesota State Histori Historical Society. He thought it was a very important way to share knowledge and, and nurture the growing of fruit in the state. But he developed friction with a lot of them because they all exhibited their fruit at the state fair. And as horse racing came to the fair and became very popular, Gideon was outraged. He thought it demeaned the importance of the fair as a showcase for human toil and accomplishment. And also, the prizes for horse racing were way more than the prizes that were given for the best fruit or whatever. The friction kind of came to a head in 1879 when Gideon took the opportunity to read an address at one of the horticultural society meetings called Fruit Culture and Fast Horses, the Civilizing Effects of the Former and the Demoralization Caused by the Latter, which was basically a long-winded rant about <clears throat> how horse racing or, or fast horses had brought on the decline of civilizations throughout history and across the world. At some point, somebody interrupted him and made a motion that the reading be discontinued as irrelevant. And Gideon folded up his papers and walked out and didn't come back for several years. So Gideon decided to take matters into his own hands and decided to boycott the fairs and not exhibit his fruit and not allow anybody else to exhibit his fruit. And this became a big problem for the Horticultural Society because Gideon was one, the one that had the good fruit and good fruit was not showing up at the state fairs. It was, however, at Wisconsin fairs and Iowa fairs. Um, Gideon was very much respected in those states by those horticultural societies. So eventually, the Horticultural Society approached Gideon and coaxed him to come back to meetings and to exhibit his fruit at the fairs in exchange for allowing him to read his entire fast horses and fruit culture and fast horses address. The reunion didn't last long because there was ongoing resentment among certain members of the Horticultural Society other experimental farms had been set up under the jurisdiction of the University of Minnesota. Uh, 
and they had not been uh, successful in developing anything close to the wealthy apple. They also didn't get paid, and some resented the fact that Gideon had a deal where he was being paid. And the powers that be at the agricultural college that were in charge of these experimental farms felt that Gideon should be answering to them. And Gideon didn't see it that way. He stuck to the original mandate that he was to report annually to the Board of Regents. So a meeting in 1889, where Gideon was not in attendance, resulted in discussion that was very petty and bad-mouthing Gideon, resentful, suggesting that you know, he'd been paid enough and the money that he was being paid should go to some of the other experimental farms. And subsequent to that meeting, the fruit farm was shut down and Gideon lost his salary. And two months later, Wealthy died. So the last decade of Peter's life must have been pretty sad. He lived out the rest of his life pretty much as a recluse, living alone, and died alone in his house in October of 1899. During that decade, he had continued his horticultural work and experiments and got into growing flowers as well. He had apparently beautiful flower gardens that went from his house down to County Road 19 and were greatly admired and, and freely given to neighbors and passers-by. Another mystery that came up in my research had to do with the Gideon House, which is on Glen Road and County Road 19, and it is on the National Register of Historic Places. Gideon's original house had been, can this work? up here on Gideon's Bay, as shown in this 19, 1879 map. Subsequent to this, he sold off a lot of the property the, in the northern part of his property to uh, a developer named the Manitou Syndicate and moved to a house at the location of the existing Gideon House that's on the National Register. But I found that this is a, this is a 19, early 1900 picture that shows the house and the orchards that were still there. Gideon's son Ansel had stayed for a few years after his death, Gideon's death, and uh, taken care of the orchards. But I came across an article saying that the house had burned in 1897, which was two years before Gideon died. And it was hard to believe that Gideon, in his old age and being as poor as he was, would have built the house that stands now as the Gideon house. And indeed, there is an article saying that a house, the property had been bought in 1902 and a house was going to be built on the site where the house had burned down a few years before. This is another early photo of the house and the orchards. <clears throat> 
So it was puzzling how could this be the Gideon House on the National Register. But I also found some evidence that possibly this was a, actually a, a shack, it would have been, that Gideon might have lived in in those last couple of years. There's a, a letter, or a visitor, a friend that visited Gideon close to his life, referred to his little house in the Maple Grove. I don't think that would describe this whole house. And his grandson Lester wrote a letter in which he talked about his grandfather's house burning down. And then a smaller house was built on the back of the foundation of the house that burned. So it's possible that this, that Gideon did live in this part of the existing Gideon house and the rest was an addition. In spite of its status on the National Historic Register, in 1993, the Gideon Woods Twin Home development was approved by the city, and the Gideon House was turned 180 degrees and moved to the corner of the property. There was also at least one Indian mound on the property. This is a monument that stands along County Road 19 near Glen Road. It was erected in 1912 by an organization called the Sons of the Native Sons of Minnesota, whose mission was to build monuments to various places and people of historic importance in the development of Minnesota. And I could swear. Colonel Sanders was a member. <laughs> it turned out that the Native Sons didn't last very long, and this is only one of only two monuments that they ever built. This is a 1935 photo of the Apple Days Queen and officials honoring Gideon at the monument. Sometime between the 30s and the 60s, the monument went into a state of disrepair. It was obviously not being maintained. And a man named James Curran purchased the Gideon House, not even knowing that it was the Gideon House. And in the process of clearing the land, he uncovered the monument. He hadn't heard of Peter Gideon, so he was curious and started researching. And the result was not only the uh, refurbishing and rededication of the monument, but the only biography that has been written of Peter Gideon, which is now out of print. Gideon's troublesome relationship with uh, the university administrators seems to have left a legacy of him being almost forgotten or deliberately um, trying to erase his memory in the University of Minnesota records. This is a land ledger for the state fruit farm that says, Peter Gideon of Excelsior, Minnesota was put in charge of this farm and on this farm, under his management, the wealthy apple was originated. The state fruit farm was formed 10 years after Peter first exhibited the wealthy at the fair. So this is another one of those uh, alternative facts that is embedded in the historical record. This is a uh, letter that Peter Gideon's fifth great nephew, 
wrote at one time to the city of Excelsior wanting information on his ancestor. And he got, <clears throat> this is not his letter, it's the response he got from the city of Excelsior, which says, according to our records, there is no information regarding Peter Gideon. If the Historical Society finds anything on this person, they will let you know. So this was from 1997. So Peter seems to have been forgotten and resurrected and forgotten again. And it's perplexing to me that uh, he hasn't given more respect. Maybe he wasn't so much a peculiar man as a man really ahead of his time. He opposed slavery 20 years before the Civil War. He advocated for women's suffrage 80 years before women, is that the right math? Anyway, a long time before women got the right to vote. Yes, his ideas were considered peculiar at the time, but maybe his taking advice from spirits wasn't so different from being guided by the Holy Spirit or relying on intuition. And maybe his abstinence from alcohol and coffee and tea and his simple, almost vegetarian, close to nature lifestyle uh, would fit right in with today's health conscious environmentalism and minim minimalism. And maybe his outspokenness would be admired today as assertiveness and instead of being a crazy driven dreamer, he would be considered a determined goal setter. So maybe he would be considered now not so much perplexing as complex. There are many mysteries left regarding Peter. There, in this slideshow, I've only shown two portraits of him, two photographs of him, and to my knowledge, those are the only ones that exist. But I encourage you to go to the, your local Humane Society and start digging into something of interest to you. You might uh, catch the bug like I did and even volunteer, which they can always use. Thank you.